There we go. It's a nice smooth start. Brilliant. Okay. Um, like Axel said uh, before, the, the kind of really exciting stuff that's happening in JavaScript is happening in, in games and hardware. This talks about the web. Sorry. <laughs> um, it, it, it's fair to say that this isn't my first talk about like, service workers. I've, I've become a little bit typecast. Um, Remy Sharp says that if you say service worker three times in the mirror, then I'll appear behind you and, and talk to you about offline web apps. I actually wish that were the case, because it would make international travel a lot easier for me. It, was, it would be a lot quicker. Although I'm, I'm sure some people would start trolling me with it. You know, I'd have to call up my girlfriend in the middle of the night. And I'm, Sorry, yeah, someone did the mirror thing again. Uh, I think it's Sydney this time. Yeah, well, I was asleep as well. Um, anyway, but back in 2013, uh, my talks went a little bit like this. And the new thing is uh, the service worker. Actually, I think this is the first talk on it. There's nothing to play with in the browser yet. So back in 2013, nothing in, in the browser at all. But now we have two fully independent implementations like in, in Chrome and Firefox. And a lot of the, the other Chromium browsers come along for the ride, things like Opera and, and Samsung Internet. Uh, Microsoft have an implementation in, in progress, and little bits and pieces are starting to, to land in their insiders builds. Um, Safari still haven't given any uh, official public commitment, uh, but they have been given giving implementation feedback on the spec, like deeply sort of technical questions. And they are implementing Fetch, the Fetch API, which is a prerequisite for, for the whole service worker thing. So fingers crossed there. But thanks to progressive enhancement, um, we've gone from like nothing in any browser to like hundreds of millions of page loads going through a, a service worker every day. And that's just in Chrome. And I'm not talking about service workers that I just used for like push messages, because we've got loads more of those as well. I'm talking about service workers with fetch events, like handling like the page loads. Um, so today, I, I can actually stand here and talk about real shipped things that you can use today, unlike in, in 2013, where I was kind of just making it up for 30 minutes. I mean, this slide in particular is a total work of fiction. Um, but it, it was good fun. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to do it again, because there's a lot of stuff that we're starting to implement or starting to think about. And I'd like to kind of share it with you and, and see what you think and uh, you know, get feedback uh, from you folks. Find out what stuff you're excited about, what stuff you, you don't really care about, um, so we can kind of base our priorities on that. I really should have called this talk Seven Things Which Don't So Much Exist Right Now, but I'm pretty excited about, and so might you be. Um, here's a journey to the future. Uh, this, this is a real FAQ page from a, a train company in Wales, uh, and it just says, uh, Can I buy train tickets for future travel? It sounds really exciting. Uh, and their answer is yes. That's the only thing on the page. It's brilliant. I, I've been to Wales before, and it definitely feels like time travel. I'm not sure about forwards. That's, um, uh, so, so what have we got coming up? Ah, streams. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about streams. And there's a lot of this like, already in, in the browser. You can already fetch your URL and, and read it out bit by bit. You just uh, fetch, get a reader for the, the body's readable stream. Uh, set up a loop and calling reader.read, and that gives you a promise for, for an object that looks very much like, um, well, it's the same as what an iterator uh, would give you. So it's two properties, done and value. If done is true, we're done. Uh, otherwise, you can log out the value. Um, I think keynote talks are supposed to be like kind of fluffy and inspiring, but I, I don't know how to do that, so I'm just going to show you lots of code. I hope, I hope that's OK. Um, but this code in particular could be nicer. While true loops always make me nervous, probably for, for no good reason. Um, but that brings me on to the, the first future feature that we'll, we'll be uh, launching in 2017, and that's async iterators. Uh, now, I learned from my mistakes in, in 2013 uh, and just showing a load of like, made up stuff on screen. Uh, so, this is the vagueness graph that I'm going to use. Uh, and right now, I would say async iterators are about that vague. Um, but do bear in mind that this graph is also about that vague. <laughs> so I hope that clears everything up. Uh, async iterators are uh, they're being specced right now. They're at stage three of the ECMAScript process. So it's, it's time for implementations. So how do they work? Well, instead of this, this while loop here and even you know, getting a reader, we can just do for await value of stream. 
Uh, it's much simpler, kind of looks like a standard for loop. And it works just the same as the, the while loop before did. And when these land in JavaScript, we'll start seeing them in web APIs, um, like DOM APIs as well. So things like the cache API for iterating over caches, um, or maybe like, iterating over a cursor in IndexedDB. You know, we, we can add it there as well. Um, you can see more about async iterators on GitHub on the, the TC39 page there. And if you can't wait, uh, you can use Babel to, uh, to make them work, along with a, a couple of polyfills. I'm only really showing you this because uh, I get to say, you know, this is the Babel REPL, which is one of the most fun things to say in our community, Babel REPL. I really like the way we, we name stuff. Um, I saw this tweet recently, and I, I, I love it. This is, I love that this is a legitimate sentence in our community. My tiny Yelp clone, built with Redux, is now up on Ember Twiddle. It's, oh, it's beautiful, it's total nonsense. <laughs> um, so when you stream values from fetch, each value is a uint8 array of bytes. But often you don't want bytes, you want something else, like uh, strings. Uh, and you can do this today using text decoder. So here I'm going to you know, create a new decoder uh, and loop over as I was before, but this time uh, I'm going to pass it the, the value through decoder.decode, and that will turn the uint8 array into uh, a string. So yeah, now, now instead of uh, bytes, we're, we're logging strings. But uh, having to call decode on each uh, bit is, is a bit of a pain, and it's passing more data through JavaScript than we really want to. It'd be nice to just have a, a stream of text. And that's going to get a, a lot simpler thanks to transform streams that will be landing next year. I say transform streams are, I don't know, a, about as vague as async iterators, maybe a, a little bit less. Um, they're still being specced, but there's a, a JavaScript kind of polyfill implementation, and uh, implementation work ha has begun. So before we introduced uh, the decoder, we were streaming stuff from the network straight into our log. No? OK. Transform streams, they're, they're this little bit that sits in the middle, uh, and that does stuff with the data before it, it sends it back. In terms of code, they look like this. So new transform stream, and then you get functions that you pass in there, like start, which is called straight away, and transform, which you know, receives a chunk from the, the incoming stream, and then you call controller.onQ to pass the value out that you want to send out the other end, and flush, which is when the incoming stream has ended. Um, you would, once you get your transform stream, it just has two properties, a writable and a readable, uh, the input and the output. And this works really well because you can create a transform stream and then just pass the writable or the readable to another function. You don't have to pass the, the whole transform stream across. So say we wanted to create a, a text decoder using this thing. So we'd you know, create a decoder function, create the underlying decoder, and then create a new transform stream. And in here, I, I just need to define a transform function. Uh, and in there, it's just going to call controller.onQ and pass the, the, the chunk through the decoder and back out to the, the transform stream. So now we're taking our, our fetch code from before. Uh, I'm just going to change this bit. And instead of having response.body, I'm going to do response.body dot pipe through decoder. And that's it done. Now, now our stream is a, a stream of, of text. Uh, pipe through connects the, the fetch stream into the writable of the transform and returns the readable. So all the logs will be text now. So we'll start to see transform streams landing in, in the DOM. And because there's a lot of stuff in the browser that you know, developers don't have access to, things like you know, comp compression, decompression, things like gzip, uh, image encoders and decoders. And they could just be streams. So we'll see that those become transform streams in time. But the first DOM API that will become a transform stream, and we've kind of wasted our time just recreating it here, the text decoder itself will, will become a, a, a transform API, a transform stream. So now you do that, strings are coming out of the, the, the end of the stream. If you want to dig into streams a little bit more, there's uh, the stream spec. Uh, it includes links to the, the JavaScript implementation. Um, I, I'm, I'm really excited about streams landing in JavaScript because, well, it, it's about time. Because we've had streams in JavaScript for, well, streams in the browser, I should say, for like 20 years. Um, like, if a page is well built, you'll see it render gradually, bit by bit. And this is because the browser streams the content from the network, and it passes it through the HTML parser, which is, you know, supports streaming. Um, uh, so this, this is a little demo app I made, uh, Wiki Offline, and it makes good use of this ancient browser feature. 
So on a low-end device over a 3G connection with an empty cache, uh, the HTML for that, that page before takes about just under five seconds uh, to download. But all of the while that that's happening, parsing is happening. And that means you get a first render really, really quickly in less than half a second. And it's th at that point, it's not real content. It's just the, the kind of top banner. But it's something. The user feels like something's happening. And then at 1.8 seconds, we get the actual first page of, of text, and like, images start downloading. And then rendering continues as, as more content downloads. As an experiment, I built this same site as a, a single page app. So here I'm just uh, serving this, this kind of basic shell and then leaving it to JavaScript to populate the page. This changes the story quite a lot. Um, the HTML fetching and parsing is way quicker because there's not a lot of it. Uh, but then we get like, the first render around about the same time, once again, just, just the heading. So performance at this point is kind of neck and neck. But while this is happening, like, the JavaScript is downloading, and then that executes, and then it fetches the content for, for the page and inserts it, and then that's when parsing happens. And now we get the content render, and that's almost two seconds later than the server-rendered version. And I'm, I'm being kind here. I mean, we see a single page apps taking a lot longer than this uh, in, in the wild. Uh, and also, this graph is slightly misleading. It looks like this single page app gets everything done in about three and a half seconds, whereas the server render takes almost five seconds. Uh, this is because as the, the server rendered version is, is downloading, it discovers things. It discovers things like images, fonts, like CSS, and it goes, oh, hang on, some of these are needed for the, the very top of the page, so I'm going to devote some bandwidth to them. Whereas in the single page app, the browser doesn't find out about that until right at this 3.5 second mark. So things take actually a whole lot longer to get things like images and, and fonts and CSS. So what can we do about this, this performance problem we've created? Well, uh, we could bring in a service worker, um, and we can return the page shell from the cache, so that download time goes way down. Uh, we could do the same with the, the JavaScript. So, so that happens. The page content still comes from the network, because you know, we can't cache all of Wikipedia. Uh, the problem is that the JavaScript initiates the download. So we have to wait for the JavaScript to execute before we, before we can think about fetching the content. We can avoid this using the link rel preload uh, tag. That's a declarative way to tell the browser, hey, you're, you're going to need this. And by doing that, we can you know, do the, the, the content fetch in parallel with the JavaScript. But so what? Like, all of this optimization later, the service worker, the preloading, the caching, were still slower than an empty cache server render. And that's because we spend all this time downloading content and doing nothing with it while we're downloading it. We've traded this, this nice progressive rendering model for one where like, nothing is displayed until we have everything. And this is because there's no API in uh, the DOM to take a, a text stream and parse it on the fly. And I hope we get that one day. Uh, but until then, we shouldn't be breaking performance by using a single page app and then trying to limit the damage. We should be taking the well-performing server render and then optimizing that even more. And streams combined with Service Worker let you do this. Like we saw before, this, this streams. Uh, the same is true if you put a service worker in the middle. Uh, even if the content is coming from the cache, it will still stream. And that's important, because if you've got like a, um, you know, a free gigabyte video, you, you still want to be able to stream that, even if it's just from disk. But ideally, we want a mixture. We want a, a single HTML response where parts come from the cache, uh, like static parts, like the header and the footer, but other parts come from the network, like the, the main content. And you can already do this in, in Chrome today. In uh, the service worker uh, fetch event, you can get like, the, the start, the middle, and the end of the response. So I'm getting the, the header there from the cache, and then I'm fetching the uh, content from the network and getting the, the footer there from, the, from a cache. Then I'm going to get readers for all of those streams. Uh, I'm going to create my own stream. That's going to be a combination of the three. And I'm going to make a response using that. And you can just do new response and, and pass the stream in. But the complicated bit is populating that stream. And it's kind of messy right now. You're, you kind of have to sort of pass each chunk from each different stream and, and pipe it into this, uh, this one we've created. 
I'm not going to talk through this, it's, it's kind of ugly, but this is going to get a whole lot easier uh, thanks to identity streams, which is another thing that's going to land in, in 2017. Now, I'd say these are a little bit more vague than transform streams, mostly because the API changed uh, about three weeks ago, but I, I think it's stable now. So to use these, back in the, the service worker fetch event, I'm going to create a new identity stream. Now, an identity stream is just a transform stream that has like, no functions passed in. So you get a writable and a readable, and anything you send to the writable is just going to pop out the other end on the, on the readable. So now I can respond with that readable part, and now I just need to populate it. And that becomes a whole lot easier. So I'm just going to create a, a, an async function here, uh, and then for every one of those responses, I'm going to pipe the body to the writable. And I, I pass prevent close here, which is just like, when you're done, don't close the stream. I'm not done yet. I've got more to do. Uh, and once we're done that, I can close the stream once all three have, have gone in. And that's it. And this code is simpler than the manual way of doing it, but it's also faster because it's not having to pass all of those values through JavaScript. The browser can see, oh, hang on, like, the, f the thing that I'm piping here is a, um, a, a stream from the cache API, which is you know, behind the scenes. And the thing it's going to is the HTML parser, which is also behind the scenes. So it can just do that whole work without troubling JavaScript at all. So now we're getting this best of both. We're piping these two sources into one response. We're responding quickly from the cache, but then getting the, streaming the rest of the data from the network. So here's where we were before. Um, and we're optimizing the server rendered version using these streams. Uh, and this happens. Like the parsing starts much sooner because it gets that big like, hit of content from the cache. And this is what it does to the render times. Like the first render is a lot sooner, but the content render is way sooner. So we get the, the quick offline first render, but still the benefit of streaming for uncached content. And with a model like this, like how fast it is, I'm kind of happy with full page loads when it comes to navigating. Um, so on, on the left here, I've got the single page app kind of model. So whenever I click on a link, JavaScript is going to you know, clear the page and start fetching the content and use like the push state API to update the URL. On the right here, I have just a website, but has a, a streaming service worker uh, powering it. And as I click on the links, um, after all the code we wrote with the single page app, it's actually slower than just full page navigations that are running without any client side JavaScript. Of course, uh, your mileage may vary. It can depend on the amount of content you have. But I, I'm really not making this up. I mean, this, this is just a demo. But I got hit by a, a real-world case of this um, a couple of weeks ago. I was in um, Heathrow Airport on airport Wi-Fi, and I was browsing GitHub. Now, GitHub, um, as you navigate around the site, it uses JavaScript to do the navigations. Like, it uses push state, and you know, JavaScript inserts the content. But if you just visit the page in a fresh tab, it uses server rendering. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click a link on this page and get the JavaScript navigation. And while that's going on, I'm going to copy uh, the URL and paste it into this new tab and get the server render. So if I set them off, um, so I click the link, paste the link here, and you know, airport Wi-Fi happens, the server render wins by a mile, even though we started it later on. You know, the, the link was clicked afterwards. And finally, the JavaScript version catches up. A lot of JavaScript was written at GitHub to make this really slow. <laughs> but it is way slower. Unfortunately, too often I hear people say, like, oh, a progressive web app must be a single page app. But I'm not so sure. I don't think it has to be that way. A single page app can be a lot of work and slower. There's a lot of cargo culting around single page apps. And, and I know what happens when you just copy someone else without really understanding the situation. Um, I, went, I went out for a meal um, with Paul Irish. Yeah, that's right. I've had a meal with Paul Irish. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyway, I watched Paul drink some wine, taste some wine. And, and he did, he kind of. He kind of just he sipped a little, he kind of swilled it around the glass like for ages, and then he took like a huge sniff of it, like a huge sniff, like it kind of noise filled the air, 
Uh, and then he just took a little sip. And I, I watched this and I was like, wow, Paul's so cool. Like, he really looks like he knows what he's doing. And, and so a couple of months later, I was, um, I was back home and I was at a restaurant with some friends uh, in England. And we decided to get some wine and I thought, I know what to do here. I, I've got this. I've seen it done before. So I took the wine and I swilled it around and then you know, took a, a big sniff. Um, but I, I tipped the wine glass just a little bit, a little bit too far. And I, I dipped my nose in it. I don't know if you've ever snorted wine before. It's not pleasant. I, I, I just kind of sneezed it everywhere. <laughs> And all my friends were just staring at me, covered in this kind of wine mist, <laughs> wondering why I didn't just drink it using my mouth. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, you might not need a single page app, right? Like, <laughs> there's a link. <laughs> but if you're using a client-side framework, you must use server rendering, but you know, even just for normal navigations, the server render might be quicker than the client-side framework. Like React, Ember, um, Angular 2, they, they, web components, they all support some degree of, of server rendering. And that way you get something on screen before JavaScript gets involved. So things are looking pretty good. Uh, however, Facebook, they've been like, prototyping with this kind of system, and they identified a, a problem. Um, they were serving stuff from this, a service worker, and they saw this startup cost there. This was uh, becoming a bit of a problem for them. It was just, um, well, sometimes 100 milliseconds, sometimes 200 milliseconds, but that was delaying the fetch for the actual content, and they, they were unhappy about that. So something that we're introducing is this idea of a navigation preload. Um, and I'd say this is a little higher on the vagueness scale. Uh, it's being specced, that's kind of in progress, uh, and we are playing around with an implementation right now. So the, the goal here is to start these two things in parallel. I'm going to rush through it slightly because um, I'm running out of time. So you would just enable it using a simple uh, a call to say, I'm interested in these preloads. And now you get uh, event.preload response appearing in your service worker. And that's something you can use to make these things happen in, in parallel. Let's skip through more of the code. But oh, yeah, I should say. When, once you're getting this preload happening, you might end up in a situation where a cached load could be slower than the network load because the network's been happening for you know, possibly 100 milliseconds already. So you might want to race the two to say, you know, we can try the cache, but if there's a network response already there, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, and it's important to note that promise.race is not your friend for doing this. Promise.race takes an array of promises, and it takes the result of whichever one ends first, not whichever one succeeds first. And that's subtly different. Like, Take this race. Here's a race. I would say this is a race that is in progress because no one has won. Promise.race, on the other hand, would say, oh, she fell over. That's the result of the race. Don't care about anything else. The whole race is a failure because of her. Promise.race is a dick. Don't use it. Write your own racing function. <laughs> Much easier. Um, so once you, you, you include these, this sort of preload stuff, uh, and you can use it, it sends a special header as well. So you can kind of know, like, oh, if this is a service worker preload, I just want to send the, the, the middle of the content, like we were doing with the, the Wikipedia example. And once you do that, uh, you can do those two things in parallel, and things become a lot faster. If you want to dig into that more, uh, there's a GitHub issue where the, the whole thing's being discussed. Right, well, I've got no time, so um, I'm going to skip this section. Look at that, it's probably really interesting. Um, <laughs> what do I want to talk about? Yeah, we're going to do background fetching. It's, it's going to be good. Um, you'll get like a progress bar as things happening in the background. I had to write an Android app just to do that screenshot. You know, it was the first Android app I've ever written. Uh, it's crap, don't do it. Stick with the web. Um, there's also, ah, yes, well, the last thing I want to talk about as the counter reaches zero um, is navigation transitions. I, it's a real shame that I see people having to um, do whole client-side apps just because they want transitions. 
So one of the things we're looking at, that's a good signal, is, <laughs> is a way to do navigation transitions um, in the way like IE used to do, but better. Um, so if you want to know more about that, there's a page on GitHub. What I will end by saying is we want to hear your feedback. This shop window sign puts it really well. Were your not till not happy? That doesn't make sense. We're not happy till you're not happy. No, it's not either. I don't know. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>